Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Good Food Institute's webinar on cultivated meat and seafood. My name is Molly O'Donnell, and I'm the Corporate Engagement Project Manager here at the Good Food Institute. Today, my colleagues and I will cover the quick moving cultivated meat industry, including the commercial landscape, investments, scientific progress, regulatory and public funding updates, and industry forecasts. We'll chat about the FDA's first green light to a cultivated meat company, consumer insights, 2022 facilities and partnerships, new scientific research, and give a global view of the regulatory landscape. We'll also have time at the end for Q&A and we'll do our best to answer questions via text during the presentation. I'll ask that you add any questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat as this helps us better track and respond to questions. And for those of you not yet familiar with the Good Food Institute, we are an international nonprofit working to develop a roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We work across the areas of corporate engagement, science and technology, and policy to accelerate innovation in alternative proteins like plant-based and cultivated meat. And we're funded entirely by philanthropy. So if you find the insights and resources we provide useful, please consider making a donation. GFI's work focuses on feeding a growing population sustainably, efficiently, and safely. Conventional meat, egg, and dairy production is a significant contributor to a number of global problems, including climate change, biodiversity loss, and public health risk. And yet meat, egg, and dairy consumption shows no signs of slowing down. Rather than asking consumers to give up products they love, we focus on making these products in a way that doesn't contribute to environmental degradation or public health risk. And we do this by sharing open access research like the report we'll be discussing today and by engaging directly with food industry stakeholders, including manufacturers, distributors, investors, scientists, and policymakers. Today's webinar is the first in a series based on GFI's annual State of the Industry reports, which were released last week. I'd like to thank the many GFI team members who contributed to this project, as well as external partners who supported with data and fact checking. GFI relies on our community to share the latest and greatest alternative protein related data with you. So if you'd like to make our reports, webinars and other open access resources as accurate as possible, please tell us about your work by joining the company database and responding to surveys when we send them out. Signing up for our monthly industry newsletter is the best way to stay updated on our research. Today's presentation will focus on cultivated meat, which is meat grown directly from animal cells. Cultivated meat is identical at the cell level to conventional meat and can provide consumers with the same sensory experience as animal meat. The cultivated meat industry is young and growing and hit a number of milestones in the past year. Let's take a look at the commercial landscape. One of the most significant developments in the cultivated meat commercial landscape in 2022 was the US FDA issuing its first ever green light to a cultivated meat company, Upside Foods. The FDA also granted a green light to another cultivate, cultivated meat company, Good Meat, in early 2023. We'll cover the regulatory process in depth later in this presentation, but for now, I'll just note that cultivated meat has never been closer to US consumers plates. Another key feature of cultivated meat industry activity in 2022 was the continued development of strategic partnerships, many of them between cultivated meat companies and major food companies. We counted 11 strategic partnerships formed in 2022. Such partnerships allow companies to collaborate on product development, scale up and distribution, likely allowing the industry to develop faster than it would if companies were working in silos. A sampling of strategic partnerships and other industry updates is shown on this slide, but I'd encourage you all to check out our detailed coverage in the State of the Industry Report, as we won't have time today to go over specific partnerships and product development milestones. There are now more than 150 companies primarily dedicated to producing cultivated meat across 26 countries and in every major world region. And these figures are likely an underestimate as it's common for companies to begin in stealth mode and announce themselves only upon completing a milestone like a fundraising round. A number of companies opened, announced, or broke ground on new cultivated meat facilities in 2022, bringing the total number of planned pilot scale or larger facilities to 27 worldwide. And two companies, Good Meat and Believer Meats, formerly Future Meat Technologies, announced facilities that would be the industry's largest yet, both producing roughly 10,000 tons of cultivated meat per year. The facilities are both located in the US and are both anticipated to be completed in 2024. 
And note that while we're actively tracking the number and size of facilities in the industry, it remains to be seen how quickly companies will actually be able to commission these facilities and reach their stated capacities. Similar to any new food production process, as cultivated meat companies transition from R&D to small commercial production, they're going to need to validate their scale-up predictions and implement a food safety plan, and this is going to take some time to materialize. The industry will need to continue to pursue innovations that allow production at scale while also lowering costs, which is a key focus for the entire industry that public investment in R&D can advance. And now let's talk about cultivated meats commercial introduction. Cultivated meat is currently on the market only in Singapore. Good Meat, which is a subsidiary of Eat Just, sells their cultivated chicken in Singapore. And in 2022, they expanded their distribution in creative ways, partnering with Huber's Butchery, as well as chefs in Singaporean hawker stalls or food stands to serve cultivated chicken. And while companies are waiting for regulatory approval, many of them are holding private tasting events. We counted 11 publicized tasting events in 2022, including a high profile event at COP27, the UN Conference on Climate Change hosted by Good Meat. We expect that many more private tastings occurred. And if you were one of the several hundred people to try cultivated meat in, in a tasting last year, please let us know in the chat and tell us what you thought. And companies are also setting up distribution partnerships that will allow them to hit the ground running upon receiving regulatory approval. Because the first commercial sales of cultivated meat will take place in restaurants, chefs are an important stakeholder group to support market introduction. And there's clear appetite among chefs for working with cultivated meat. A 2022 survey found that 86% of a 251 person sample of chefs and food service professionals were interested in serving cultivated meat. And a few companies have already successfully secured partnerships with high profile chefs including Dominique Crenn, who will serve as Upside Foods Cultivated Chicken in her Michelin star restaurant in San Francisco, and Jose Andres, who joined the board of Good Meat. So what do consumers think? Before discussing the results of some recent GFI Commission consumer research, I'd like to note that consumer research to date has been performed largely in a pre-launch environment. So we expect the results of consumer surveys and testing to improve as products come to market. That being said, research so far indicates consumer interest in cultivated meat. An online survey commissioned by GFI and conducted by Embold Research in December 2022 found that 45% of respondents would try cultivated meat and 23% would buy it. And these figures were higher for consumers aged 18 to 34 and for consumers trying to eat less meat. Other consumer surveys have found that anywhere from 29 to 80% of respondents are willing to try cultivated meat and younger consumers are typically more likely to report interest in trying. And when asked about reasons for interest in trying cultivated meat, survey respondents identified curiosity and novelty as the top motivators, followed by environmental reasons, animal welfare, and global food security. But many consumers are not at all familiar with cultivated meat. Consumer research conducted in December 2022 by GFI and Embold Research found that only 32% of respondents reported having heard of cultivated meat before. There's clearly a large opportunity for consumer education and exposure. And in recent years, the industry has begun to coalesce around the term cultivated meat, as you can see from a GFI survey of 44 cultivated meat companies in 2021. And in 2022, GFI APAC joined over 30 industry stakeholders in signing an MOU recommending that cultivated be the preferred English language term, along with cognates for cultivated in other languages. And cultivated also performs well with consumers. The December 2022 and bold research survey found that cultivated meat offered the best combination of differentiation, accuracy, and appeal to consumers. And now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Daniel, to discuss cultivated meat investments. Thanks, Molly. I'm Daniel Gertner, and I'm the business analyst on the corporate engagement team here at GFI. In this section, we'll look at private investments in cultivated meat companies and how those investments fit into the larger economic environment. Before diving into cultivated meat investments specifically, let's briefly discuss broader alternative protein investments. All protein investments totaled $2.9 billion in 2022, down 42% versus 2021. While that decline might seem drastic, it was only slightly larger than the 35% drop in total global funding across all sectors in 2022. It was also smaller than the declines of some popular VC-funded sectors like FinTech, which saw funding decline by 46%. So 
So what trends are influencing these global investment declines? 2022 was a challenging funding environment for companies across industries, falling public equity markets, rising interest rates due to high inflation, ongoing impacts of the pandemic, and the invasion of Ukraine all contributed to reduced investment activity across all sectors in 2022. And in a relatively young sector, like alternative proteins, a handful of sizable raises can drive the top line investment numbers. In 2022, for example, 3% of deals accounted for half of total investment dollars in all proteins. So in a sector this size, one investment can have significant implications for year-to-year -year variations in investment totals. When we take a longer term view over the past decade, cumulative investments in alternative proteins reached $14 billion. That means on average, all protein investments nearly doubled every year over that span. Of the $2.9 billion in alternative protein funding in 2022, about 900 million went to cultivated meat companies. This was the second highest annual investment total ever for cultivated meat, second only to 2021's $1.3 billion. All-time cultivated meat investments now amount to $2.8 billion. And over the past few years, investments in cultivated meat companies have not only grown, but have also comprised an increasing share of total all-protein investments, up from 10% in 2016 to 2020 to 31% today. So what's the big takeaway? Regulatory advancements and exciting innovations from new and existing companies are helping to de-risk the space. This is further solidifying cultivated meat as an ESG and growth engine in investors' portfolios. There were notable developments in both investment depth and breadth in 2022. Upside Foods' $400 million Series C round marked the largest single investment ever in a cultivated meat company. Plus, over 100 new unique investors entered the cultivated space last year. That brought the total number of investors since 2016 near 700. In terms of liquidity events, JBS, the world's largest meat company, completed a $39 million acquisition of biotech foods in 2022. That marked the largest acquisition in the cultivated space to date. It also demonstrated that conventional meat companies are actively interested in the cultivated meat sector. Continued engagement from the world's largest meat companies is a positive sign for the industry's ability to quickly scale. Another key shift in 2022 was how global the investment landscape has become. Over the past decade plus, North America, and specifically the U.S., has dominated the global alternative protein investment story. But global investment funding has increased as alt-protein awareness and popularity grow around the world. While cultivated meat funding declined in North America in 2022, it grew in Asia-Pacific and Europe. In Asia-Pacific, cultivated meat, cultivated meat investments increased to $95 million in 2022, almost doubling in the last year. In fact, 2022 investments were larger than all previous investments combined in APAC. In Europe, cultivated meat investments increased 30% year over year, rising to $130 million in 2022. That equated to over a third of all time investments in the region. Regional expansion around the globe is exciting and important. The more investment capital is diversified by region, the more resilient the entire industry will be to future shocks. So why do investments in cultivated meat matter in the first place? Investments are absolutely necessary for the scale up of these critical but underinvested climate mitigation solutions. Animal agriculture contributes 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, yet alternative protein and cultivated meat investments still comprise only a tiny fraction of total climate technology funding. Today, all protein sales make up less than 1% of the global meat market. Meanwhile, renewable energy has grown to more than a quarter of global power generation, driven by over 500 billion in total climate investments every year. More public and private investment in alternative proteins can help this nascent sector become another powerhouse for global impact. And impact often starts with measurement. To help industry participants measure some of the climate and other non-financial characteristics of all proteins, GFI and FAIR developed a new set of environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, frameworks for the alternative protein industry. These frameworks help investors transparently understand the impacts of their investments. So to step back, we know the alt-protein industry has a long path toward delivering on its potential. 
While the investment gap between alt proteins and other climate tech is large, it also indicates a massive runway for growth in alternative proteins if they are able to attract the capital that can help them scale. And now I'll pass it to Claire and Elliot to cover updates in cultivated meat science and technology. Thanks, Daniel. My name is Claire Baumkamp. I'm one of our lead scientists at GFI and I focus on cultivated meat and seafood. Um, so I'll start with a quick update on some of GFI's new and updated resources in 2022. So we've continued to build out our alt protein literature library, which is a resource a resource for scientists and other science interested folks to learn about what's going on in cultivated meat and other alternative proteins. So in 2022, we continued tracking publications in this space, including 214 new publications about cultivated meat. Um, and this included 12 publications from cultivated meat companies, um, which is something we're starting to see more of and is a trend we're really excited about, um, and also 14 publications by uh, GFI grantees. Our university team absolutely crushed it this year, adding five new how-to guides for students wanting to build alt protein communities um, at their universities. And our alt protein project, which is a network of student groups across the globe, added 20 new student groups to, to their community. We continue to build out our solutions database, which is a resource for um, researchers trying to find new research areas and work on the most kind of impactful problems in the alternative protein space. Um, and we added uh, 19 new concept notes, um, which are essentially one pagers describing a key need in the alt protein field um, related to cultivated meat. Um, when it comes to our research grants program, we were able to fund 10 projects on cultivated meat. Um, and this is not including the five projects that were focused on flavors for alternative seafood, which we feel could have um, sort of uh, cross pillar impact, whatever, whatever technology you're using to create um, alternative seafood, they could have some relevance there. So either 10 or 15 projects, kind of depending on how you count it. Um, and so for the cultivated meat specific projects, the total was 1.4 million that we were able to award to these research groups. Um, we were also really excited about one publication um, that our GFI Europe team put out um, as sort of a, a commentary to, to rally the research community. We also published four peer-reviewed articles um, along with our colleagues and collaborators. Uh, we published uh, two new or updated technical deep dives on cultivated meat and one white paper analysis on growth factors. And on the next slide, um, so an update on cell lines. Um, so an ongoing challenge for researchers in both cultivated terrestrial meat and seafood, um, but especially seafood, is the lack of readily available cell lines from species and cell types that we care about in cultivated meat. And so this was an area where we saw quite a bit of progress in 2022, which was very encouraging. So one example of that was a new paper from uh, the Kaplan Lab at Tufts University, um, which helps to address this challenge by creating an immortalized line from Atlantic macro muscle. So this is the MAC1 line, which has been cultured um, or had been cultured at the time of this publication for over 130 passages. And from P37 to 43, uh, these cells underwent a spontaneous immortalization crisis. And so the cells that survived this crisis appear to be a spontaneously immortalized line. Um, they have a doubling time of around 24 hours. Um, and that's pretty good compared to the 64 hours from the original cell population. Um, and so importantly, they also uh, performed species confirmation and testing of myogenic potential, um, both before and after the crisis event. So this really supports the idea that the cells that survived the crisis were indeed a true immortalized muscle line um, and not a contaminant. So this is a really big deal for cultivated seafood, um, but still a, a long ways to go in terms of availability of cell lines. And on the next slide, um, so a new preprint this year um, or last year uh, described the isolation of muscle and fat cells from large yellow croaker um, and the creation of a 3D printed cultivated fish prototype using these cells. One interesting aspect of this study was that the researchers used micro CT scanning of conventional fish muscle tissue um, and used that to guide the design of their 3D printed construct. 
And so this construct mimic, mimics the fat content, cell type distribution, and muscle fiber orientation of the original tissue. Um, and in the bottom in the bottom panel here, you can see an example of aligned and differentiated muscle fibers within the printed construct, as well as a count of cells over time. So this indicates that the cells can both proliferate and differentiate within the construct. Um, and so this paper is really exciting to me because while tissue engineering techniques have been applied to mammalian cells for years in a biomedical context, this study is really one of the first published examples where fish cells are grown on a 3D scaffold. And with that, I will turn it over to Elliot for some more science updates. Thank you, Claire. My name is Elliot. I'm one of the other cultivated meat scientists at GFI. And I'll be talking a little bit more on some of the scientific developments in 2022. So on the bioprocessing side of things, a research team from the cultivated meat company Believer Meats in collaboration with researchers at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem published the most comprehensive study to date on cultivated meat production. In this study, they describe how to grow their chicken cells in serum-free conditions and turn them into fat. And they also described how they achieved densities of over 100 million cells per milliliter or 360 grams per liter in a stirred tank bioreactor. So although it's yet to be demonstrated uh, whether or not uh, companies can maintain these uh, densities at larger scales, these impressive data demonstrate for the first time that cell lines used for cultivated meat production can perform at least as well as productive cells used in the pharmaceutical industry. For media, we, along with collaborators from several growth factor startups and regulatory experts in Singapore, published an analysis that looked at the anticipated production volumes and costs for growth factors used in the cultivated meat industry. And one of the key findings was that not all proteins are used equally. So for instance, albumin is used at such high concentrations that it would make up nearly 97% of the anticipated demand for protein, making it an important cost driver. The good news is that albumin doesn't necessarily need to be supplied through recombinant production. Researchers at Tufts University demonstrated that you can isolate proteins from various plant seeds, which can functionally replace uh, recombinant animal albumin and media at a fraction of the cost. In 2022, the FAO conducted extensive research into the food safety of cultivated meat. Meetings that convened international groups of experts were held in Israel and Singapore to aid the FAO's understanding of cultivated meat production. The results of this research were published earlier this month in a 146 page report. And this report contains key information on terminologies, production process, three country case studies, and, and hazard identification in cultivated meat, which is the first step in a formal risk assessment process. Overall, this landmark report will help assist countries around the world in developing evidence-based approaches to regulating cultivated meat. 2022 also saw the publication of three new life cycle assessments that look at the environmental footprint of cultivated meat production which included the first to assess the environmental impact of a hybrid cultivated burger product from the US company Sci-Fi Foods. Updates to the widely cited study by CE Delft were also made and published in the International Journal of LCA. And this research found that cultivated meat is anticipated to be nearly three times more efficient at converting feed into meat than chicken production, which is the most efficient form of conventional meat. This efficiency translates to cultivated meat requiring 64 to 90% less land, depending on the type of meat, and other improvements in environmental indicators such as air pollution and marine eutrophication. Finally, in a review process that took over one year, the United States Food and Drug Administration shared in November that they had no further questions with respect to the safety of cultivated chicken that was produced by Upside Foods. This news was a historic milestone for the industry and a signal to the rest of the world that cultivating animal cells is a safe way to produce meat. Consumers in the United States are likely to soon gain access to cultivated products following USDA grants of inspection and decisions on labeling. This completed pre-market consultation included the release of over 100 pages of information from Upside Foods, as well as the FDA that relates to the safety evaluation and production of cultivated meat, which makes them crucial scientific documents. So for example, the documents detail the safety of cell line development and immortalization protocols, evaluation of immediate ingredients and residues, microbial content of end products with relation to foodborne illness, as well as detailed nutritional information, including the amino acid, fatty acid, vitamin, and mineral content of the product. So shown on this slide are the macronutrient comparisons between cultivated chicken produced with or without serum, as well as conventional store-bought chicken. And overall, you can see that these have uh, similar nutritional profiles 
uh, between cultivated chicken as well as store-bought chicken. In March of 2023, the company Good Meat also completed their pre-market safety evaluation for cultivated chicken, and we expect more to be completed by FDA in 2023, which will add to the growing body of cultivated meat knowledge. So I'll now pass it over to my colleague, Maddie, for some updates on regulation and public funding. Thanks, Elliot. Um, I'm Maddie Cohen. I'm the senior regulatory attorney on GFI's policy team. And I'm going to highlight a few regulatory updates from the past year or so. So starting with China, uh, the country is really looking to promote biotech and the bioeconomy, uh, which includes a focus on cultivated meat. In 2021, we saw the Chinese government include cultivated meat both as part of its green biological manufacturing R&D program, as well as its five-year agricultural plan. And then in 2022, uh, President Xi Jinping emphasized the need to create energy and protein from plants, animals, and microorganisms and establish a greater food approach in China. The government also released a five-year plan for the, the development of the bioeconomy in 2022, which includes exploring alternative proteins and other novel foods. Um, in this past year, the China Cellular Agriculture Forum also held its first ever event um, at which they discussed regulation and labeling of cultivated meat. And then in December, Chinese officials met with officials from the US FDA to discuss cultivated meat safety and regulation. In Japan, the government announced that the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare is going to assemble a team of subject matter experts who will study the food safety aspects of cultivated meat in order to help the government determine the best way to regulate these products. Um, and as part of that, the government has commissioned uh, the Tokyo University of Agriculture to examine risk assessment methodologies uh, for cultivated meat. And in February, um, another Japanese ministry announced its vision of promoting food tech, which includes uh, includes a roadmap for food technology and specifically uh, includes developing cultivated meat in the country. Uh, in the UK, uh, which has so far retained the EU's novel food regulation for evaluating all novel foods, including cultivated meat, uh, has announced that they're looking to form their own regulatory model. So in 2002, the UK Food Standards Agency launched a review of the existing framework and is looking to identify and evaluate several other potential regulatory models for novel foods. So we might actually see a new system for evaluating cultivated meat products in the UK in coming years. In Australia and New Zealand, um, FSANS has announced that the country's existing food regulatory system um, is equipped to evaluate cultivated meat under the country's novel food standards. So they're not planning on creating any new um, system specific to cultivated meat. And Vow Food announced that it has submitted an application to FSANS for approval of its cultivated quail. So if approved, that would be the first cultivated meat product available in Australia and New Zealand. And FSANS is also working with uh, Canada's food regulator, Health Canada, to conduct safety assessments for GM foods for companies that are looking um, to apply for approval in both jurisdictions and which could apply to some cultivated products. And then I just want to mention a few other global updates. Uh, Israel has been collaborating with the UN FAO on um, the regulation of cultivated meat and the prime minister's office is currently working on a plan to ensure that Israel continues to be a leader in the AP industry and a leader on cultivated meat. And uh, the country's chief rabbi has also announced that Ela Farms cultivated steak is kosher, which is a promising sign for having cultivated meat products certified uh, kosher by certifying bodies. Um, and Canada, like Australia and New Zealand, has announced that it's going to regulate cultivated meat under its existing novel food regulations and won't be creating a new regulatory framework. And in Singapore, um, the Singapore Food Ag Agency or SFA um, has once again updated its guidance on novel food assessments, which does include information on cultivated meat assessments. And uh, excitingly, the agency approved the use of serum-free media in good meats cultivated chicken products, um, which are already on the market in Singapore. Looking to the US, um, as many of you may know, back in March of 2019, 
um, the US FDA and the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service entered into a formal agreement um, about how they will jointly regulate cultivated meat. And under that agreement, FDA oversees all of the initial stages of cultivated meat production, including cell collection, banking, growth, differentiation for all foods made of cultivated animal species. Um, this includes a pre-market consultation process that Elliot discussed where companies submit information and data on their cultivated products to FDA to evaluate the safety, um, as well as ongoing oversight and inspection by FDA after this pre-market evaluation is complete. Um, from the point of harvesting the cultivated cell material from the bioreactor, uh, which agency has regulatory jurisdiction depends on the species. So if the material came from livestock, poultry, or catfish, which are species that um, USDA already regulates under existing federal law, then regulatory oversight passes from FDA to USDA at the point of harvest. And USDA will oversee any additional processing, packing, labeling of the products, and also will conduct inspections. But if the original cell material came from a fish other than catfish or from shellfish, then there is no transfer of jurisdiction. FDA will um, keep its regulatory authority over any post-harvest processing, packing, labeling, inspection. In terms of how cultivated meat will be labeled, um, both FDA and USDA have agreed to develop joint labeling principles for the products under their respective labeling jurisdictions um, to avoid any confusion and make sure that there is harmonization across the entire spectrum of cultivated products. And both agencies have already gathered public comment on labeling, but they haven't released any sort of guidance or regulations yet. Uh, but the USDA has added a notice of proposed rulemaking on the labeling of cultivated meat products under its jurisdiction um, to the U.S. Unified Regulatory Agenda, which essentially means that it may issue a proposed rule for labeling cultivated meat at some point in 2023. But in the meantime, um, USDA will pre-approve cultivated meat labels on a case-by-case -case basis, so companies don't need to wait for those labeling regulations to be finalized in order to submit a label to USDA for approval if they're ready to go to market. Um, FDA, on the other hand, generally doesn't pre-approve labels, but they might release guidance on how products under their jurisdiction should be labeled. Uh, and finally, just some next steps on um, upside and good meat after they've completed FDA's pre-market consultation process. There are a few additional regulatory steps that they'll have to complete before we can see these products in restaurants or in grocery store shelves. Um, they'll all need to register any facility involved um, in the production of cultivated meat with FDA. Because they're producing chicken, which is overseen by USDA, they'll need to obtain a grant of inspection from USDA and also obtain USDA label pre-approval. And then both agencies will continually oversee the parts of the production process for which they have jurisdiction. And USDA has said that it will be inspecting uh, these facilities at least once per operating shift, which is the same rate that they currently inspect conventional meat processing facilities. And then once those steps are complete, hopefully we'll finally get to taste these products here in the US. With that, I will pass it on to Michael to discuss public funding. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, I'm Michael Carter. I'm a policy associate here at GFI. Uh, so in addition to making progress on regulatory issues, governments also increased their public funding for cultivated meat research and development. 2022 saw the largest individual investments from governments to date, impacting many points along the supply chain. The Netherlands, which is known for its innovations in agriculture, made the world's largest investment in cultivated meat with a 60 million euro initiative to develop a full cellular agricultural ecosystem, including R&D, commercialization support, education, and workforce transition resources. The UK, Norway, Canada, and others announced investments in foundational R&D, while Canada also worked to develop manufacturing capabilities for bioreactors. In the United States, President Joe Biden released an executive order calling on agencies to produce a report on how biotechnology and biomanufacturing could be used to cultivate new food sources, and the resulting Bold Goals report published last month positions alternative proteins, including cultivated meat, as key components of a future American biomanufacturing ecosystem. On the next slide, we'll see that governments in Asia and the Middle East also took major strides in supporting cultivated meat. 
Israel and Singapore continue to be world leaders in cultivated meat investment, with Israel beginning an 18 million consortium announced in 2021, and the two countries working together on a joint project to develop cultivated seafood. South Korea also invested $15 million from a fund for high-level future technologies, a major increase in its support for alternative proteins. And to round out President Biden's executive order, both China and Japan, the second and third largest economies globally, highlighted the importance of cultivated meat in their future plans too. China included alternative proteins, including cultivated meat, in their agricultural and bioeconomy five-year plans, and the Prime Minister of Japan personally called cultivated meat an important technology from the perspective of realizing a sustainable food supply. All in all, governments around the world stepped up their investment in developing cultivated meat science and technology and indicated that cultivation may figure prominently in their future plans. I'll pass it now to Daniel. Thank you, Michael. Now we'll look at a few cultivated meat industry forecasts and what's ahead for the market. Before discussing the top line numbers of these projections, I think it's good to remind ourselves what forecasts can and can't do. Forecasts can help us visualize where a market might be headed. They can also help identify key accelerants and roadblocks on the way to those potential outcomes. What forecasts can't do is make any given outcome more likely. To achieve or exceed projections, industry participants need to continuously work to make products tasty, affordable, and accessible. So with that as a backdrop, cultivated meat forecasts released in 2021 and 2022 predicted significant growth for the cultivated meat sector. Projections predict 2040 meat market shares ranging from 10% to 35%. With only a small amount of cultivated meat currently on the market in Singapore, the scale of this projected growth from essentially 0% market share today is difficult to overstate. The most obvious factor working in cultivated meat's favor is the fact that it's the same as conventional meat at the cellular level. In 2022, the average plant-based meat product failed to match conventional meat's sensory experience. Fully cultivated products or hybrid plant-based and cultivated meat may help bridge that taste and texture gap. This means there's a large runway for cultivated meat's growth, but the industry's ability to, to actually achieve that growth will depend on other factors like consumer acceptance, and building efficient production and distribution networks. Regarding consumer acceptance, according to research conducted by GFI and Bold Research that Molly mentioned earlier, nearly half of U.S. adults would consider trying cultivated meat, and that number rises to 60% in the 18 to 34 age range. This is a positive sign for the long-term prospects of the industry, and plus we expect this willingness to increase if production costs continue to decline and awareness of cultivated meats benefits grows. But the eventual size of the cultivated meat sector relies on more than consumer acceptance of these products. An entire production and distribution infrastructure needs to be developed for cultivated meat to reach store shelves and restaurant plates. And the industry has already made progress toward that goal. At the end of 2022, the world's top two CPG and top three meat companies by revenue were active in the cultivated meat industry. Plus, startups and B2B companies continue to improve the costs and efficiencies of the cultivated meat supply chain. All of that said, today, production costs for cultivated meat remain well above those for conventional meat. Right now, the average cost of production is likely north of $100 per kilogram, and regulatory review means it's difficult for new products to quickly achieve market entry. Other factors like expensive cell culture media, suboptimal bioreactor design and availability, and limited access to suitable cell lines are other challenges for near-term growth. While those challenges are significant, the fact remains that conventional meat consumption is vast and growing. The FAO projects that the global meat market will grow from 360 million metric tons in 2022 to 455 million metric tons by 2050. Global climate goals hang in the balance, as does restoring biodiversity, improving food security, and protecting public health, all of which are impossible to achieve by continuing with business as usual meat production. Cultivated meat can play an important role in the shift to alternative proteins. So where is the cultivated meat market headed? In 2023, U.S. consumers may get their first taste of cultivated chicken, and the U.S. FDA has indicated that more regulatory reviews are on the way. Plus, as more cultivated meat products enter the market, 
plant-based producers will be able to use cultivated inputs to create hybrid products, potentially enhancing alternative protein sensory experience. All of these things will play important roles in supporting the growth of both the cultivated meat industry and the larger alternative protein market. And with that, I'll pass it back to Molly. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you all for tuning into our presentation on cultivated meat and seafood. We are really excited about cultivated meat's potential and we hope you are too. But we know there's a ton of work ahead. We need investments in R&D and equipment, fair regulatory frameworks, continued product innovation and consumer education. So if you're involved in this growing industry, we wanna stay in touch. Please sign up for our newsletter to stay looped into all GFI resources and events. And with that, let's begin the Q&A. Um, so just a reminder, please continue to add your questions to the Q&A box rather than the chat. And we'll try to answer as many as we can in the next 20 or so minutes. Um, so first question that came through was around um, hybrid products. I think it was referencing our slide on um, distribution partnerships, asking if most of those products were hybrid. Um, now I don't have any data on the, the really specific um, example cited in front of me, but it is true that most of the products that are going to come to market are going to be a mix of um, cultivated meat and plant protein. Um, companies will typically do this to bring costs down as uh, cultivated meat inputs are still quite expensive. Um, and there's also a chance, you know, consumers might be looking for some of those plant protein benefits like fiber. So we're seeing companies um, mixing some cultivated animal cells with things like mung beans or pea protein. Uh, and this is a a trend that we're expecting for most of the first launches and something we're expecting to see in the near future. Um, so next question here um, for Elliot, how significantly are raw material, cloth, raw material costs declining? Yes, yeah, so this is a, a good question. So the raw material costs generally, uh, when you refer to that, would refer to the inputs in the cell culture medium. So I'll just drop in the chat. Um, we published a study about, I think, almost four years ago now that looked at cultivated uh, meat media costs and how we anticipate them or how they could be anticipated to drop in the future. Um, so I would encourage you to read that report. Um, in terms of what's happening in the real world, it's sort of uh, the, the steps are as follows, where we have to create a food grade supply chain. So a lot of the inputs right now are sourced from the sort of pharmaceutical industry. And so there are a variety of different suppliers that are working to provide those same inputs at food grade so we can use them in cultivated meat production. Um, and we also have to scale up certain inputs, um, especially amino acids, certain growth factors and other, other components um, that can contribute to cost reduction, as well as come up with sort of creative or innovative ways to um, replace really uh, expensive ingredients like the example that I mentioned in the slide related to recombinant albumin. And so overall, um, we've seen that, you know, anecdotally, companies in the industry have been able to significantly decrease their cell culture media costs, in some cases, 99% or more from where you would um, otherwise have a sort of comparative, similar pharmaceutical grade cell culture media. Um, and I think we'll see more publications uh, in the peer reviewed literature that um, support that level of cost reduction as well in the near future. Awesome. Thanks, Elliot. Um, and next question, also kind of around cost, um, is scalability. So scalability continues to be cited as a major hurdle. Are we optimistic that this hurdle will be cleared in the next decade? Um, Claire, do you wanna take that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is this is a very good question. And um, I mean, to be honest, I would say, no, it's not going to be cleared this decade because this is, this is a huge, thing we're talking about of, you know, um, making cultivated meat at um, sort of prices and scales that that match conventional meat. I do think that we will see substantial um, progress in terms of scalability and cost in the next decade. Absolutely. Um, but I think this this is a long term um, process. So, um, you know, I would I would say I'm optimistic when it comes to scalability, but um, kind of trying to balance that optimism of, yes, this is going to happen. Yes, companies are making great progress. Academic research is providing the foundation for that, um, but also being realistic about this is a big challenge and it, it's going to take time to, to really get to the, the costs and scale. That, that we're that we're looking for here. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. Um, so our next question, really appreciate this one. It's about um, building up the government and research ecosystem in Latin America. And um, this person's wanting to know what has worked well with engaging with governments and researchers in other areas. Um, I will put in a plug that we have a, an affiliate office in Brazil, um, so we can type in their website if you're interested in getting in touch with GFI Brazil, but we don't currently have a presence uh, in the rest of Latin America and really appreciate um, that there are folks wanting to, um, to build on a lot of the work that's been done in other regions. So um, with that, Michael, would you like to um, share a few lessons about what's been you know, resonating with policymakers uh, in terms of public funding and, and ecosystem building? Yeah, sure thing. We've seen a huge increase in public funding for alternative proteins in 2022 for a lot of reasons, um, many of which I think would be uh, uh, very relevant in Latin America. Um, so first, uh, on climate, uh, animal agriculture is a huge producer of greenhouse gas emissions, especially methane, um, which at COP26, most countries agreed uh, to attempt to reduce their methane emissions 30% by 2030, a reduction that is only really possible by addressing animal agriculture and its emissions. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of movement towards alternative proteins on that basis, but then also on the basis of land use. Uh, so three quarters of all agricultural land is used for animal agriculture, so either raising or feeding livestock. Um, and so that is especially relevant in the Amazon basin, um, where the Amazon rainforest is largely being deforested for um, growing soybeans um, as animal feed or raising animals themselves. Uh, so that's a huge reason to support alternative proteins is a new way to make uh, that food. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the land use benefits of extent to biodiversity as well and preserving critical ecosystems. Uh, 2022 also saw a, a shift towards alternative proteins on the basis of food security. Um, so the massive geopolitical turmoil in the wake of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, really cast a lot of countries' food supplies into doubt and showed how much uh, food or animal feed is sourced from uh, other areas where countries don't have control over the geopolitical situation. Um, and so being able to uh, onshore more food production, um, especially protein production, which you know currently requires so much land, uh, is actually a, a huge, it's a national security um, aspect as well for policymakers that are concerned about that. Um, and finally, as we've heard a bit today, uh, cultivated meat is a, uh, a, it's a growth industry. We're expecting to see a lot of economic value come out of this industry, a lot of jobs, including very uh, high value, um, high uh, knowledge uh, STEM jobs. Um, and that's very attractive for policymakers as well. So those are the three main arguments we're seeing, or the three main stated reasons that governments are investing in alternative proteins. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, next question for um, Elliot or Claire, how close is cultivated meat to reaching price parity? Um, and how does it compare to plant-based meat in terms of um, the potential to reach price parity uh, with animal-based meat? Sure, I, I can try to take a stab at this. I'll, I'll drop a uh, link to a slide deck that I prepared uh, that touches on sort of costs and how to think about costs at a high level. Um, since obviously there's a, a sort of key question um, and cost is probably the major barrier that cultivated meat companies are going to have to uh, address over the coming years. The short answer is we don't know exactly the timeline for cost reduction um, as a lot of companies are still in the R&D stage, just entering their pilot scale facilities um, and optimizing a lot about their processes. So we know that cost is driven primarily by the cell culture media, as well as the infrastructure. So new buildings that need to be created, as well as the equipment like bioreactors that need to be uh, in those buildings. We're gonna need a lot of those. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think we've done, we have pretty good idea that cost reduction has happened quite a bit in the cell culture media um, sector, but um, you know, bringing down costs related to uh, production, the bioprocess um, in these new facilities is going to take longer time. And so we actually don't have concrete estimates on what we estimate is sort of like the average uh, cost of production today 
or what that would be in, in five years. We just don't have the data accessible yet. But you can check out that slide deck that I posted um, to get a better sense of sort of how we view cost right now. Awesome. Thanks, Elliot. Um, so we have a question about the cultivated seafood market, how large that market is, um, and how large it could grow to be. So I'll just share um, a few stats that our team pulled um, from some GFI resources. So in U.S. retail right now, conventional seafood sales make up about a fifth of total meat sales. And globally, we estimate that that market is worth uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and we think cultivated seafood could potentially earn a significant share of that market. Um, our company database right now shows that about 50 companies are working in the cultivated seafood market. Um, and one notable uh, investment that I'll call out for cultivated seafood in 2022 was wild type. Um, this is in our state of the industry report. We have a section on notable fundraising rounds, um, which I encourage you all to reference. Um, they raised $100 million, one of the largest uh, raises in 2022. Um, and if you have any further questions, um, you know, kind of specific data points on the cultivated seafood market would encourage you to check out the state of the industry report um, or email us at corporate at gfi.org. Um, so that being said, I love this question. Is there a key scientific breakthrough you'd love to see happen in the next two years? Um, Claire, would you like to take that? Yeah, I can start with one specifically on the seafood side. Um, so something that um, I've been thinking a lot about um, over the past year or so is this question of kind of cell types in uh, in fish. Um, and I mean, the same, you could apply the same question to, um, to marine invertebrates as well, or aquatic invertebrates, I should say. Um, but, you know, I think we, um, we have a lot of kind of conventional wisdom about how um, sort of the different cell types that exist for one thing within muscle tissue in mammals um, and, and birds are, are, for the most part, I think, fairly similar to mammals. Um, but I think we don't have a clear answer as to are there key biological differences between fish and um, and these other species that have been studied a little bit better. Um, and so I think we're making a lot of assumptions as to um, what cell types even are present, what um, what types of adult stem cells um, develop into what mature cell types. Um, and so I think there's a lot that could be done. And a really, really key underlying piece of all that is just the tools for cell type identification, which is, I know is a really boring answer. Like somebody needs to develop better antibodies and other tools for cell type identification. Um, but we we held a workshop actually a couple months ago in January where we had 90 scientists in the room talking about kind of the biggest challenges in um, just getting fish cell culture to be a little bit less of a pain. Um, and that was something that I was actually surprised, you know, we knew it was a problem, but it came up again and again in every breakout room. Um, and so I would, I would really love to see some, some progress on the cell type identification and just understanding kind of the key biology of the cell types, um, within fish muscle tissue. Um, and I'm sure Elliot has another answer to this. Well, I'll just comment uh, briefly, I, you know, breakthroughs are weird word, word. So I, I'd sort of uh, frame it as like, what, what sort of information do I want to see? And I think um, as Claire alluded to in her slides, we saw uh, over, I think a dozen publications um, in the peer reviewed literature from cultivated meat companies last year, um, as well as uh, really an in-depth paper um, from the company Believer Meats. And so I think that should hopefully incentivize other companies to similarly publish their results in the peer reviewed literature. And I'd be really looking forward to seeing some sort of validation data uh, from cultivated meat companies of their process at like the hundred liter scale or above um, from their pilot facilities that they're opening today. So that's what I'd look forward to. Thank you both. Um, so next question is about uh, plant-based meat sales and cultivated meat sales and target consumers. Um, and if we kind of segment those uh, consumer early adopter groups in the same way or not. Um, it's a great question. I wish that I had uh, a more specific answer to give you. I think, you know, we definitely need a lot more um, consumer research to better understand um, the target consumer group motivators and barriers 
to cultivated meat consumption. Um, but one thing that I will say is that I'm pretty excited uh, about the potential, as I mentioned before, for hybrid products. I think um, cultivated meat, uh, as well as you know, cultivated fats maybe added to a plant protein product have the potential to mitigate some of the, the leading barriers to plant-based protein consumption. Um, research shows that consumers feel that plant-based uh, meat products should be sort of one-to-one -one in terms of sensory experience of animal products. And, you know, on average, many products on the market are not uh, quite meeting that yet. And so I think that um, adding some, you know, maybe animal cells uh, to a plant-based product um, could potentially increase uh, plant-based meat sales for that reason, or, or increase sales of hybrid products. Um, but yeah, definitely an interesting space um, and, and something that I think in terms of the, the consumer segmentation question in there that we'll need a little bit more uh, research to answer. Um, next question here is around um, the animal meat industry involvement in cultivated meat. Um, so we do have some data on this in our state of the industry reports, um, four of leading 10 um, top CPG and meat companies are involved right now in the cultivated meat space, either through investment, acquisition, um, partnerships, or R&D in manufacturing. So um, Nestle has uh, had partnerships and they're also um, reportedly working um, to develop in partnership with the startup some cultivated meat products. Um, Tyson and Cargill have made investments in cultivated meat companies. And then uh, JBS, as we mentioned, acquired a cultivated meat company that was uh, uh, completed last year. So um, it seems that there's definitely interest um, from the incumbent meat industry in cultivated meat. Uh, and we're excited to see these companies um, creating partnerships with cultivated meat startups, maybe lending some of their distribution uh, networks and expertise uh, to this industry. Um, let's see, next question here. Do we have any more? I we can comment on the shelf life question that just came yeah, up. So people, someone asked about the shelf life for cultivated meat. I think that's an interesting question. Um, the short answer is I, I don't think we you know, necessarily know for sure. We need more data on that. But if you look at some of the data that's included in these FDA pre-market consultations that we've been talking about, the microbial counts on the end product are significantly lower than what you'd find in you know, conventionally uh, produced meat that you'd, you'd buy at the store. So uh, because sort of spoilage and shelf life is very much uh, sort of determined by the bacterial load on these products, we anticipate that the shelf life could be significantly longer for cultivated meat products. Um, but again, I think we need more uh, concrete data to make a definitive answer. Awesome. Thanks, Elliot. Um, and we have time for, for just one more question. And it looks like there's only one more here. Um, and apologies, I think I saw you answer a related question um, in the chat, but maybe you could just add to that. Someone's asking about um, potential additives or preservatives um, for cultivated meat products. I know we mentioned, you know, some of the products might be hybrid products that might have like a mung bean protein in them or something. Um, are there any other ingredients that could be used in say a cultivated chicken product um, that would make it different from a conventional chicken product or, or maybe it's something that really depends on the specific company and product? I could take that one. So um, I would say, um, you know, for the most part, when if you're talking about, you know, you have a piece of cultivated chicken tissue, um, the processing is probably going to look very similar to conventional chicken. Um, and if you're thinking about preservatives, there's probably less of a need for preservatives because of what Elliot was just saying about the reduced um, microbial counts. Um, and something I think is, is interesting that's been brought up as um, maybe a potential hazard, but I think one that's very easy to mitigate is this idea that um, if you have some kind of benign bacteria on um, a piece of meat, that can actually be protective against more harmful bacteria. So we might actually talk about, I like to think of it as kind of like a fine mist of yogurt, um, like very, very small amounts of bacteria or, or other microorganisms that we know are absolutely fine and are like more fine that you, than what you would find if you just swabbed a piece of steak from the grocery store. Um, so that could be one potential consideration. Um, 
one thing for seafood is omega threes as as an input. Um, but I mean, if you're thinking about additional things you need to put in, um, I would say most of that is going to happen on the cell culture media side. So we're definitely going to need to be thinking about what's going into these products and um, you know how that's going to. Um, we had some questions about nutritional composition, so the media composition is absolutely going to affect um, the composition of the final product. So I I would think of it not so much as additives um, post culture period, um, although there certainly could be some of that. But I would think of it more as almost analogous to you know animal feed. Now we're we're not talking about animal feed. We're not talking about cell feed. So that's kind of um, how I typically see that. But again. Um, it's going to depend very much on the, on the products. There are going to absolutely be hybrid products out there. Um, so I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. Um, thanks so much, Claire. And we are right at time, a little bit over time. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us for this webinar today. Um, as a reminder, there are two more webinars in this series that'll be next Tuesday and Thursday, um, same time. And you all will also receive a copy of the slides and recording uh, later this afternoon. Um, so thank you again for tuning in and um, I will see you next time. Have a great day, everyone.